Well, the G20 has just ended in India, and Nigeria was invited, even though Nigeria is not part of the G20. And we're concerned about the uh, lessons that we could learn from the G20 and how it affected or, yes, it will impact on Nigeria and its economy. But first of all, the India that hosted the G20 would like to know also how uh, this has affected them and how the leadership of India has stirred the G20 to wherever it has taken them. And we are glad to be uh, joined by Mr. Oberoi, Mr. Surinder Singh Oberoi, a freelance communication professional. Uh, he has joined us today and we also have Dr. Frank uh, Ta Abagan. A senior lecturer, Department of Political Science, Benue State University, Makodi. Let me first of all say good morning and welcome to Mr. Oberoi. Good morning and thank you for having me on your show. Okay. And Mr. Abagan, uh, Dr. Abagan, good morning and welcome to the show. Morning. Morning. Thanks for having me. Okay. Let me begin with you, uh, Mr. Oberoi. Uh, our time is fast spent. We could have had so many other questions for you. But right now, uh, we had this G G20 in India. India has stirred the ship of G20 from December last year till now. And at this time that the G20 had the meeting in India, the uh, Congress seemed to tactically um, boycott the, the G20. Uh, leaving everything at the hands of uh, the, the executive to carry on and take responsibility for whatever decisions have been taken. Uh, okay, so we would like to know uh, if this boycott, this tactical boycott by Congress, affected the proceedings at the G20 and also beyond the aesthetics uh, of India because of this G20, what other impact it has had or it will have on India. Just um, answer them together if you can. Sure. sure, thank you. You know, first of all, let me tell you, as far as uh, Indians are concerned, they have a sense of pride among them that finally the G20 has been quite successful and they have been able to bring in the voice of Global South also into the G20. Uh, that is like AU becoming a permanent member. So we can easily say now G20 is G21 mm. now in the present scenario. Well, India's strategic gains have been there. And if there was a test for the leadership for the India, as far as the global leadership is concerned, I would say that India has passed this test, even though domestically, as you rightly said, that Congress more or less was having a passive uh, boycott of this thing, but it's their own loss for their domestic elections. They, on one hand, are trying to bring in all the opposition an alliance together. And one thing which you might have noticed uh, on the visuals that uh, to counter the India word, the Prime Minister is using the word Bharat. That is all local domestic politics to regain or to uh, be in a better position in the next election, which is supposed to take place around April and May. But if you look into the global positioning of India, it of course has gained a lot, especially with the Delhi Declaration. And if you compare the Delhi Declaration with the Bali Declaration, India very smartly has shown their diplomatic skills, where both Moscow as well as US is saying that it's a win-win position for them. And if you look into the seven paragraphs which were mentioned about the Ukraine conflict, I think for the first time, they said the conflict in Ukraine and not conflict on Ukraine sort of a thing or a war on a conflict. And the word Russia was nowhere there. But still, they mentioned about the sanctions of the United Nations, which strongly condemned and put up the uh, Russia on the back foot through the G7 sort of a thing. So India was, I would say, conclude by this uh, round. Uh, saying that India was able to balance the G7 with Russia-China balancing. And they were able to get the document signed, which in itself was a big achievement because a day earlier it looked like that things are stuck up and things are not happening. And finally, the show went off very well. Other issues also, like green development, inclusive growth, uh, transparency, in, as well as their... Uh, uh, what's it called as reforms for the women betterment and other issues we have much discussed and a good document has come up 
It's a 37 page big document, which I have in my hand and it's becoming difficult for me to also read all these pages in it. Mm. But it's an important document, I would say. In fact, this brings in a, a roadmap for India to enter into the United Nations, which they can again try to claim for it. And as you know, China will always object to it. Okay. Well, l let me talk to Mr. Bagan, Dr. Bagan now. Um, Africa AU, the African Union, has been given a place in, in that alliance as a permanent member. Uh, President Bola Tinubu was invited. Nigeria was invited, even though Nigeria is not a member of the alliance. Talk to us about how you see the G20 impacting Nigeria India relations and Africa and global relations from this G summit, G20 summit. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that question. We, we've used additional platforms for interacting with the world. We've used the World Bank, the IMF, uh, you know, all the London and Paris Club for credit for foreign investment. We've always looked towards the West. But here now comes a new multilateral platform. Uh, new in the sense that we were not using it, but Nigeria is strategic. One, we're the largest economy on the continent. So you cannot engage Africa without engaging Nigeria. Uh, President Bola Metunubo has gotten some concessions for investments directly from the Indian ec economy in oil, in uh, steel, in, you know, in power production. So for Nigeria, we've extracted promises for investments. Traditionally, we've always related with India. We have, we have a lot of similarities with them. The, fundament, the most fundamental one is we have the same colonial masters, though they attained independence before us. And uh, some of the technologies we are trying to acquire will be easier to acquire from a country that has passed through the same kind of political and economic history we've had. So more engagement with India will help us. The G20 promises a new alternate platform for getting credit, for getting foreign direct investment into our economy. And I guess that's one of the reasons why President Bola Ahmed Tinubu was invited. It's also a consolidation of the relevance and importance of Africa. Uh, the other platforms Africa has been interacting with India, they are in BRICS. Uh, India and South Africa are in BRICS, but Nigeria is not a member, though we've applied for that. But here comes an alternative platform to engage the world outside the Bretton Woods arrangements. We're seeking a situation whereby we can do more direct trade, we can have more technology transfer, we can also have an increase in the GDP growth rate, which India has enjoyed, about 7.8% annually for the past three or four years. This is impressive. So our engagement with India is like, uh, we'll have like put, we're discovering a brother. We have so many things in common. We're in the tropics, so in terms of impact of the environment, it's the same with us. It's the northern part of India that is a bit temperate, but the southern parts are tropical. They also have issues with flooding. They have issues that we can relate to. And uh, I think this, this is a, a new chapter for understanding. We've always had relations with India. If you recall, even in terms of health tourism, India has improved its health sector so much so that they were a cheaper alternative to getting medical attention away from the shores of our country, Nigeria. So I think this is a, a new platform for us to achieve much more than we've achieved in the past before. We've always engaged with the West but we can take uh, stock and see that maybe it has not gotten us where we need to go. So this new rediscovery of India is going to be a good thing for us if our government keeps faith with them. All we need to do is to create an enabling environment for our Indian partners to come in and invest so that we create more jobs and create economic wealth for, that, for our countries. But would you say we've done enough as a country to tap into the, this exodus towards the, the east, as it were? People are migrating, uh, if well, I may use that word, from the western uh, economy to the eastern, the Asian, the, the and Chinese and all that. Yes. Have we positioned ourselves enough to do that? 
Yeah, I think we can. We, we have, but we can. And um, we need to have alternatives. We need to have alternatives. Okay. You can see trading with the West, you can see the situation we're in. We need to maybe get technology to improve refining capacity. It's going to be cheaper doing business with India. India has repositioned itself as a leader of the global south. So that, that puts India in a very, very strategic and powerful position. So with Nigeria from Africa in tow, and with South Africa behind, I think it's going to be a good thing for us. The time has come for us to see where we can acquire that technology at the faster level and with a more dedicated level than we've done in the past. We've tried uh, to get a technology from the West, but the, 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 the situation has not been very smooth for us. Okay, let me, let me just, um, a final question for Mr. Oberoi. Mr. Oberoi, what are some of the takeaways you think Nigeria can borrow from not just uh, uh, the G20, but from India as well? In your yeah, experience? The oil countries, with more, yes. So this is the situation we're in. So, we're trying to see if we sorry, can have an me, alternative platform. Sorry, Frank. Movement. Sorry, Frank. Let me, let me go to Mr. Oberoi. Yeah. Mr. Oberoi, please. Yeah. Can you hear my question? What are some of the takeaways, very briefly now, because our time is up? Mr. Barrow? Can you hear me, Mr. Barrow? I don't think he can hear me. Let's channel the uh, question to Mr. Frank on a final note. Okay. What are some Sorry, of the... Sorry, I was on mute. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes, but could uh, you hear the question? So, what, if you ask me, I would say that, uh, you know, the meetings between the Nigerian president as well as with the business community has been of a great success. In fact, more than a hundred corporates we have attended the Nigerian-India Business Council uh, meetings, which were a series of meetings, as well as the president also of Nigeria met with some of the old Indian companies like Hindujas and others who are already doing huge business, like Airtel, uh, Bharti Enterprises and others. So that is where the business, of course, is going to multiply and many of the countries are going to work on it. The other issue where Nigeria showed much of the interest is on the uh, uh, sort of a biofuel, where again, some Indian companies, I think, are going to cooperate with Indian companies uh, and Nigerian partnership is going uh, to be fruitful. And the other issue where an important meeting has come up, which has not been as yet disclosed, what were the contents of it? I have been told that there has been a very successful meeting, meeting between the Defense Minister of India, Mr. Rajnath Singh, and the uh, President of Nigeria, uh, Mr. Bola. Uh, the meeting in which it is believed that the Nigeria government is going to buy some light combat uh, planes, aircrafts, as well as some combat carriers which are meant for the land. And also there are going to be some sort of a joint trainings which are going to take place between India. Uh, it's more or less on a capacity building which will be there as well as uh, how to tackle the terrorism and other issues are important. Right. So those things have been discussed in length. And uh, also drone technology most probably is going to be shifted. Lastly, the technology transformation, uh, uh, how this uh, technology transformation can be given from India towards Nigeria to bring in the digital economy on a better scale. Well, so those are yeah. the issues right. as well as on the education. Oh. There are going to be a partnerships as well as education. Yeah. Mr. Singh, uh, time will Thank not you. permit us further would have loved to even take a look at the declarations the daily declarations that they concluded at the summit with but time will not allow us thank you so much for your time mr surinda singh oberoi freelance communications uh, uh, person joined us from india new delhi india and then we had dr ter abagang who is a senior lecturer department of political science Benio state university makurdi thank you so much Jen and for your time on the program this morning. Okay. So before yeah. we leave, we give them the quote of the day. Yeah. Well, nothing can dim the light that shines from within. That's from Maya Angelo. That's our quote of the day. Nothing can dim your shine if it comes from within. I am Maureen Menongwe. Zuki, thanking you for being a part of the show this morning. I am Nyamgul Agaji. Let's do it again tomorrow. Bye for now. Bye. <laughs>